Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. My name is Eric and in today's video I'm going to show you how to make a low-tech version of Pemmican using no modern appliances. Heck, we're not even going to use electricity. Pemmican is a Native American survival food that packs a lot of calories and is shelf-stable. It has an enormous shelf life. The shelf life of Pemmican completely depends on how you make it. If you render your suet properly and you only stick with beef and fat, you can have a pemmican that can easily last you 20, 30 years, some say even 50 years, when stored in an airtight container in a cool, dark place. One last thing I want to say before we make this low-tech version of pemmican is that if you actually think you're going to need pemmican, don't wait and make it. Make it right now with the tools and the conveniences that you have at this very moment. If you wait until you're in a survival situation to try and make pemmican, this is a relatively challenging recipe to make. With that being said, Let's make pemmican. To make pemmican, we need to prepare our meat for drying. We're using lean beef in this recipe, but you could use elk, bison, uh, venison. Just make sure that it's lean, and when you're finished, this is what it should look like. No silver skin, no fat on it, and once you have it like that, go ahead and cut your meat into slices against the grain. The objective here is to dry our meat as quickly as we can. So you're going to want to pound your meat with a stick or a meat pounder so that it is paper thin. And if you happen to rip it during this process, that's okay. The thinner, the better. We're just going to take that once it's completely pound flat and we're going to paste it on a drying rack. Now that our meat is paper thin, let's go ahead and dry it. And oh, by the way, I forgot to mention at the end of this video, I'm going to show you how to cook a dinner with this pemmican. So be sure to stick around for that. There's a couple ways to dry your meat. Drying option number one is the sun. Now we're going to take our drying trays and we're going to go to the roof of our house. We have a hot tin roof, a clear sunny day. It's nice and breezy perfect conditions to dry our raw meat. We're just going to put some mosquito netting around some cinder blocks to keep any bugs, mosquitoes, any critters away from our raw meat, and we're going to let this hang out all day. This works really great in areas of the country where it's hot with low humidity. Uh, our meat's been drying for roughly about 10 hours, and it's still not cracker dry. So we're going to take our meat down from the roof and just place it in our kitchen until the very next morning. If I leave it out overnight, the humidity throughout the night is a lot higher and I think there's a good chance it may rain. So we're going to bring it in overnight and the next morning, 7.30 in the morning, we're going to go ahead and put it back on the roof. We're projected to have another nice sunny day on day number two of drying. So we've got 10 hours from yesterday. We brought it inside. Now we're on day number two. I rotated the trays. Uh, it's a nice breezy day outside. I want to make sure that all the pieces dry evenly. Uh, and I checked on them about every hour and a half, roughly. Each time we rotated the grates around, we flipped the meat over, and because it was paper thin, after about 15 hours of actual dry time, this meat is completely done. So let me at least talk about uh, drying option number two, which is fire. If you build a small campfire, the radiating heat around the fire will not only dry your meat, but it's also going to give it a nice smoky flavor. You do want to rotate your trays and turn your meat around for this process as well, just so that it dries evenly. But as soon as it's dried, we're going to take our meat inside to finish the process. A little test to know if it's finished that if you bend your meat with your fingers, it should immediately crack. If it's flexible in any way, you need to continue drying it until it becomes cracker crispy. So, Let's put all that to the side and grab our mortar and pestle. And this is what we're going to use to take our meat and turn it into a powder. This process can be a little time consuming and requires a lot of energy. If you don't have a mortar and pestle, you could use two rocks and your end result should be somewhat of a coarse powder.
this is what our meat powder should look like. It's coarsely ground, it looks great. It's now time to add our rendered beef suet. Beef suet is the fat around the kidneys on the count. We typically buy quite a bit of beef suet at a time from our butcher. We render it down because it keeps great outside of refrigeration and it works beautifully for making soap and candles. So we tend to have this all the time. We're gonna go ahead and melt some of this rendered beef suet over an open fire. And as soon as it's mostly melted, we're gonna bring it in the kitchen so that we can finish this process. The rest of this recipe is actually very easy. We're gonna mix uh, as best we can, because we're gonna eyeball it here, but equal portions of fat with our meat powder. So if you wanna be super precise and you have a kitchen scale, weigh out your meat powder, and then whatever that weighs out to, add that same weight in rendered suet. Our pemmican is officially done. We've got equal parts fat to powdered meat. And at this point, you can form it into balls, put it into a mold, make little strips out of it, because tallow at room temperature will naturally harden. So I'm just gonna take it, form it into a rectangle on some wax paper, and let it sit on my countertop for you know one or two hours. After it's hardened up, I'll cut it and place it into vacuum sealed bags, store it in a cool, dark place where it'll be available to eat in the event that I need it. And that's how you make pemmican. Now let me show you how to cook with pemmican. You can make soups with it. You can make stews with it, depending on what you're working with as far as ingredients go. You could just eat it by itself, which is what we're gonna do here in just a second. And I'm gonna share with you my thoughts on how this pemmican tastes. But as you can see, it's easy to cut. It's e easy to break apart. I mean, it's just meat bound together with rendered fat. So you can just break it apart pretty easy. And uh, this piece right here, I think, we're gonna give it a little taste. Pemmican, let's see what it tastes like. You know, there's not really a lot going on with this particular pemmican. There's no sweetness coming from it. We didn't add any salt, so it's relatively bland. It kind of tastes exactly as you would expect it to taste, which is unseasoned dried meat. The tallow leaves somewhat of a waxy coating in your mouth, so at, you know, at a certain point it gets a little difficult to, to chew and swallow. The texture is okay. The powder was a little more coarse than our original pemmican, but other than that, it's a relatively simple food item. So why don't we go ahead and uh, cook with it and see what it's like inside of a dish. There are a lot of different ways to cook with pemmican, and what pemmican is gonna do to your dish is add a beautiful beefy flavor. It's gonna rehydrate that beef and act almost like a bouillon cube. So we're gonna saute some onions leeks, we're gonna add some carrots, and we're gonna cook this in some rendered beef tallow until the carrots and the leeks and the onions begin to take on a little bit of color. This is gonna add a lot of flavor and a little sweetness to our dish. So once we've got a little color on our onions and carrots, we're gonna go ahead and add our celery, mushrooms, our crumbled pemmican, our cabbage, and our garlic, and we're gonna to continue to saute that in that rendered beef tallow. We're gonna season this with some kosher salt, a little black pepper, and we also have some smoked paprika and some dried tomato powder that uh, we made. It's gonna give it some nice flavor, and it's gonna help thicken it up just a tiny little bit. And then we're gonna add some red chili flakes as well as some coriander powder. To finish the recipe, we're gonna add some tomatoes, our green cauliflower, and about three quarts of water. And we're just gonna bring this to a simmer on a medium, medium high heat before we add our noodles. Now, if you don't have noodles, you could serve it with rice. You could add potatoes, that would make a great addition. You can even add beans to this dish and it would just help bulk it up a little bit. We ended up using about eight ounces of pemmican to make this particular uh, hearty vegetable noodle soup and it ended up feeding about six people. And some of you have asked what the nutritional value for pemmican is. Well, it depends on how you make it. If you make this recipe for every pound of pemmican or 16 ounces, you're gonna get 4,617 calories, 258 grams of protein, and 390 grams of fat. Our soup is done. It smells absolutely amazing. 
And what I want to do is I want to taste the broth first to see if that pemmican actually made that big of a difference. Let's see what the broth tastes like. Oh, that's nice. It's not overly beefy. Uh, a little sweet, the broth, and that's in part because of the vegetables, but you can definitely tell that there's beef in the dish as it was broken up so finely. Every spoonful has got a little bit of pemmican in it. As far as flavor goes, there is a lot going on in this vegetable noodle soup. Let's taste this. Mm, so tasty. This soup is hearty, it's jam-packed with flavor, it's beefy, and we only had to use a little bit of pemmican to feed a lot of people. Thanks for watching the video. If you got any questions on how to make pemmican, leave them in the comment section below. And if you're new to the channel, we'd like to say welcome. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. We post new videos each week. We'll see you in the next one.